Menschen sind. Die erste ist die vierte Bitte im Vater unser, unser tägliches Brot gib uns heute. Die erste ist die vierte Bitte im Vater unser. Der griechische Urtext spricht von ton aton hemon, ton epiusion. Die Schwierigkeit in der Deutung ist hier das epiusios. Es ist ein Neologismus, das heißt, es ist das erste Mal in der Literatur... Dass You can't put 
toothpaste back into the tube, they say. Nature is much the same way. February was too warm. Nature's out. Far too early. This time the snow didn't do too much damage. But in no way was this the last time that winter will make an appearance. La legna scalda tre volte, they say in Italian. Wood heats thrice. Once when you cut it, the second time when you carry it into the house, and the third when you light it in the stove. I have a chainsaw, but when you spend a lot of time sitting inside, it is a welcome change to wrangle the old handsaw with its missing teeth. When you go for walks in the Alps, you may chance upon the majestic Ibex. If you do, you may as well greet it with ciao. For really, they are all Italian. Or at least their ancestors a few generations back were. For by the 19th century, the Ibex had been hunted almost to extinction, except for a small population north of here. There were less than 100 individuals left in what would become Italy's first national park. Nowadays, due to conservation efforts, they're back in the entire range, numbering some 55,000. Far more easily startled are its distant cousins, the chamois, alpine antelopes. Well, more precisely, a species of the less flatteringly named goat antelopes. You can tell how to disapprove. I have a pair living in the rocks beneath my hut. They go higher in the summer but can be observed all year round, also down here. That is, when the chumpy creatures don't go running at the first noise, whistling as they warn the others.
On the southern side, after a few sunny days, it was possible to return to work outside. One of the challenges of working without machines in this kind of terrain is that you have to try to be efficient. I can't just dig the hole, put the earth somewhere, later fill the earth bags and then bring everything back. In order not to heave every cubic yard two or three times, I have to dig, fill the bags and build as I go. Not ideal. It is more difficult that way to adjust or adapt anything later. but. That is the way it is. It had been windy for a few hours, though my hermitage is pretty sheltered. I watched the leaves dance. And welcomed my newest neighbor, who apparently had just moved in. But as the roaring got louder on the counter slope, I started worrying about the other neighbor. It might be just a 10 minute walk, but it is a different world over there. Not only does the ground rarely thaw until spring, but when the storms hit, it takes the brunt of the force. Martin's place had been hit really bad. I got there just a few minutes before he returned from the valley. He had left the car to get a saw because a tree blocked the road, but found much worse as he came down. He was quite stoic, and then sarcastically said, Well, at least it's going to be great content for YouTube. I think I would not have been quite as chill. Mountain Life so far it had spared Martin most of the extremes it offers in this part of the world. 
The second winter had been mild like the first. Rain never went to the excesses I'd experienced twice in my short eight years, washing away access roads. But today the mountain showed that on his flank we are but guests, tolerated only if we are made of sterner stuff. Running into some very hard rock, I organized a little helper.
the old balcony, both the metal railings and what was still good of the wood, was recycled to construct the raised bed in the Wallapini. Renewing the balcony was an improvement project that I had done in the winter before, a winter that had been just as mild in January as this one.
The part below the balcony is completely removable. Same is true for the panels top and bottom, making it not only a seasonal refuge for some of the more delicate plants, but in the winter the small space warms up and provides passive solar heat with the doors to the house left open. On milder sunny days, of which there are many here in the winter, I rarely now fire the stove. All in all, a really great addition. That also provided useful leftovers for the Valipini. The modern world is fascinating. The fact that what happens on this mountain can be shared with the world by a few clicks, and that such sharing would one day be something commonplace, would have seemed incredible to me when I was a kid. Even that I found myself digging a second hole in March, dreaming of lemons, was owed to the marvel of flowing electrons and cables hundreds of thousands of miles long. Otherwise I probably would have never heard of Volipinis, as these underground greenhouses are called. Looking back at the last few centuries, it seems no wonder that progress was and is on the lips of everyone. This progress, without doubt, 
owes something to a peculiar circumstance in Western history. In the 13th century, when theology, drawing on Aristotelian philosophy, had a high regard for reason, and the bright, aspiring forms of Gothic cathedrals rose into the medieval skies, the highest ideal of man was the contemplation of God. That does not mean that it was otherworldly. Think, for example, of the founding of universities, establishing of hospitals, and the technological development soon fostered in the Cistercian order. Christianity was never a stoic contempt for the world, but simply the clear order between this life and the next. The role of the church was comprehensive in people's lives, so much so that even decadence, scandals and sin among its clergy and in the pews, which have always existed, could not fundamentally call it into question. All this changed in the Reformation. The Renaissance, humanism, the philosophic currents of nominalism and voluntarism had prepared the way. A greater emphasis was placed on the individual and the fideistic, anti-rationalist current of the Reformation mistrusted reason because of what they saw as the complete depravity of man. The Catholic synthesis of Greek thought and Christian faith was denounced as a corruption of the gospel. The Bible and personal conscience were pitted against tradition and the authority of the Church. The fact that the Bible alone was not as clear as the reformers had preached would lead to heated disputes over its meaning among the new Protestant movements, each claiming clarity and the discernment of the Holy Spirit. They had abolished one pope, and now there was someone making papal pronouncements and excommunicating others at every corner. Luther might have hidden from Catholic princes in the Wartburg, but Lutherans would, a little later, imprisoned the Anabaptist leader Fritz Erbe in the very same castle because he read the Bible differently when it came to baptism. Europe changed forever. Wars soon followed. It is true that in these clashes religion was often just a flimsy cover for political purposes. When, for example, the French Cardinal Richelieu supported the ambitions of Protestant rulers during the Thirty Years' War, and thus cheerfully driving the horrors on, this was not done with regard to matters of faith, but simply to weaken Habsburg dominance in Europe, promoting French interests. Irrationality, power plays, social unrest, war and epidemics transformed religion from the immovable foundation of medieval culture into an uncertain ground on which people stood irreconcilably opposed. In the end, pragmatic solutions won the day, and the individualization of religion. Among the intellectuals, new ideas took shape. If religion could no longer explain the world in a unified way, and the search for wisdom and the ultimate reasons of existence had become a minefield, science was now to step into the breach. Science as it was newly understood. In order to avoid the question of God, It was no longer to concern itself with the end, the goal of things, the why of it all. The focus was on the more mundane questions. What are things made of and how do they work? The focus shifted from meaning to utility. Soon the world itself was understood as a machine. And even if God was not initially denied, he was relegated to being there at the beginning like a watchmaker. Corks fitted, adjusted, wound up, and the world, like a giant clock, has been running ever since. Man's new task was to subdue this creation. According to the philosopher Descartes, man was to become master and possessor of nature. No longer was he a gardener, as in Genesis, as a caretaker and steward of God's works, but someone who through understanding could manipulate and make things useful for his own purposes. Man was no longer part of nature, but its subjugating master. At this threshold, the modern world begins. 
It has since been revealing the secrets of nature, promoting, preserving and often saving human lives through technological advancements. At the same time, however, a targeted exploitation and often destruction of the world was initiated by philosophy that, devoid of any questions of meaning, increasingly crossed ethical boundaries and several times already has led humanity to the brink. And it may be the thing that ends us all. The fact that knowledge has become power, in a very literal sense, is both a blessing and a curse. And increasingly a curse, the less the questions, what is man in the final analysis, and why is he, find a profound answer. It is not that these questions are obsolete because science has proven the meaninglessness of human existence. No. Modern science, or what people often mean when they speak of science, has been conceived, as we have seen, with a very narrow focus on the material, the quantifiable, the countable. Unlike elusive questions about wisdom and the meaning of life, questions that have to be argued over, science has led to practical inventions and machines. It is not that there had not been any technological developments previously. There had been. But typically, they were embedded in the deeper questions of mankind. They themselves were never at the center of thought and aspiration. The primary interest of the ancient world, and also of Christianity, was how man could lead a good and just life. It asked what his destiny was, his goal. Although medieval men broke down the thick Romanesque walls and built cathedrals high into the sky with the help of static calculations and feats of engineering, the stated ideal in the midst of this undoubtedly technological achievement was never the mastery of the cosmos, but the mastery of oneself through virtue and faith. That latter kind of mastery, I contend, is still worth pursuing. In fact, if we want to speak of progress, there is simply no way around it. For the word progress has no meaning if we discern no meaning in the world. For only those that accept that there is an end, a goal, are able to judge if a particular thing, an invention or development, is in fact getting us closer to that end and is progress, or will lead us further away.